Okay, so in this video, we are going to be focusing in on sampling. We're going to be starting off by taking a look at, well, why do we engage in sampling? What are the rationale behind this? Why don't we just use the full population? From here, we'll move on to four different types of sampling that we can engage in. That is, if we were tasked to collect a sample, what are four different valid methods that we could engage in in order to collect a random sample? And that's the big part, a random sample. That's what we're looking for in this case. What we'll finish off with in this video is taking a look at our idea of sampling error, the idea that, okay, because we're pulling from a sample, every sample we pull from the population is unique. Every sample we pull from the population gives us insight into the population, kind of gives us an idea as to what's happening, but there's likely some error in this insight as well, and that error is what we'd call our sampling error. So that's the purpose of this video. In the next video after this, we'll take a look at the actual application of this. We'll take a look at how this expands to allow us to use what's called the central limit theorem, which is a really cool, really powerful theorem that we can use in statistics to take advantage of our normal distribution. So that being said, let's start off by taking a look at why we engage in sampling to start with. That is, why don't we just use the full population each time? Well, okay, why don't we use the full population? First of all, it's too time consuming. Quite often, it's just going to take way too long to collect, contact, or even to locate the entire population. Example of this, think about every month, Statistics Canada, they release the unemployment rate. Now, the unemployment rate is a statistic, right? It's a sample statistic. It is saying it's an estimate as to how the percentage of the labor force that they believe is unemployed. Now, keep in mind, this is just a sample. It would take way too much time, way too long to contact, to locate every Canadian and say, hey, what's your current work situation? Are you working? Are you not working? If you're not working, are you looking for work? Right? So instead of doing that, instead of engaging in all that effort, all that time, they just collect a sample. They get a subset of the greater population and they ask them. So often it's just too time intensive. Kind of our first reason as to why samples samples are the only feasible method. Next, well, often it's going to be too cost prohibitive to find or to study the entire population. It would just be way too expensive, right? There's just the economic reason here. It would cost us way too much to go and find the entire population. And this could be the same thing, right? We could use that same example as the unemployment rate. We could go get every single person in Canada, get them to complete this survey, but the cost of having a call taker go and do that to every single person would be astronomical, would be unrealistic, it would not be worthwhile. So, okay, often it's too costly to find the entire population or to study the entire population. Third, uh, sometimes there's a physical impossibility in actually checking the entire population. So, for example, here in the Greater Victoria area, we have blue-green algae blooms in our swimmable lakes. So Elk, Beaver Lake is the big one there. It happens in Langford Lake, Glen Lake, Durance Lake. They all have green-blue algae blooms. For the most part, these are low enough in concentration that they don't pop, um, pose any risk to people or pets. But certain times of the year, these bloom and they create health risks. Well, in checking to say, okay, what is the concentration of this blue-green algae? We cannot test the entire lake. We cannot go through, test all the water in the lake to find the concentration. Instead, we need samples, right? You're going to collect water samples at specific locations around the lake, and these samples are then representative as to what the concentration is on the lake on whole. So in this case here, right, it'd just be physically impossible to check all the water. That'd be the population. So because it's physically impossible to test all the water, we rely on these water samples. Fourth reason. Fourth reason why we don't want to use the whole population is that some tests are destructive in nature. So for example, you just went and you created a new vintage of whiskey, or you just created your new year of wine, and you want to test its quality. You're like, mm, is this a good wine this year? Is this a good whiskey this year? Well, by testing it, you consume it, you destroy it. So you wouldn't want to test your entire population because you'd have no wine left to sell. You'd have no whiskey left to sell. So in that aspect, in that 
process of testing it, you're destroying it, and even if you did go and you were able to test the entire population, well, you probably wouldn't remember your results. So, given the destructive nature of some of our tests, sampling must suffice. Finally, this really summarizes our previous four. Our fifth kind of reason as to why we use samples is that the sample results are often adequate, right? So let's use an example where you want to buy a new car. And maybe really for some reason you have your heart set on a 2012 Ford Focus and you're like, hey, what is a fair price? What is the market price for this 2012 Ford Focus? That is, if I find one for sale, am I being ripped off? Is it being charged too high or am I getting a good deal? Well, so you go out there and you start looking up 2012 Ford Focuses for sale. Do you need to find every single one that is for sale in order to get an idea as to what an appropriate price is? No, not at all, right? What you can do is very quickly, with only maybe 10 being sampled, you'll find that these 10 being sampled, they're all going to be approximately the same price. Some will be a bit higher, some will be a bit lower, and you can get a good idea as to the fair or market price for this vehicle. So in that case there, right, you don't have to go through all that extra time of finding every car for sale. You don't have to have all that cost, right? In that case, there'd be your opportunity cost, what you've given up by looking for cars rather than doing other productive things. It may be physically impossible, and well, it's not destructive, so we don't need to worry about that. But right, in the end of the day, the sample result was adequate. After 10 or so, we got the result we were looking for. We're happy. We can move on. So... That's kind of the idea with that. That's the idea as to why sampling is often good, why it's really all we need to do. What we're going to take a look at next, we're going to take a look at our different ways in which we can sample. So let's jump over and take a look at sampling methods. So the first thing to realize is with sampling methods, what we're really looking at is random sampling. So random sampling such that every single member of the population has an equal and independent chance of being chosen, right? So amongst our entire population, maybe it's water sample, maybe it's people, maybe it's bags of Doritos. Every member of that population has an equal chance of being chosen. And because your neighbor was chosen, that does not influence the probability that you will be chosen. Every member has an independent probability of being chosen. In this sense here, equal, independent, we have true randomness amongst our population, and thus we want to take a look at ways in which we can collect these random samples. So let's take a look at that. Let's start off by taking a look at, let's start off by taking a look at our simple, simple random sampling. So like we were saying in each of these cases, the goal is to obtain a sample such that it's random, such that every member of society was equally as likely to be chosen. Simple random sampling, basic kind of way, let's suppose that we have a company that has 500 people. And, right, so that's our number of population, population big N. Out of these 500 people, we want to collect a sample of 50 people. So this is our sample, little n. And we want to collect the sample in a random fashion, right? So at random, we want to collect 50 people. And maybe we're interested to know the gender balance within the workplace, right? We want to know, hey, this is a tech firm. Is this being dominated by males? Is this being dominated by females? Do we have an appropriate gender balance that is representative of society? Well, okay, how do we go about engaging this? Well, you can clearly think of some ways that would be bad to do this. For example, if you were just to go stand out in front of the men's washroom, and as people came out, you're like, oh, there's a man, oh, there's another man, right? And you went through, and you're like, okay, there we go. I just sampled 50 people. They were all men. We have way too many men working here. Well, okay, maybe that wasn't the best way to go through it, right? Maybe that wasn't truthfully random. Not everybody in your population had an equal chance of being chosen. You stood outside of the men's room. So simple random sampling, what we would do is, this is essentially, we would take all 500 names and we'd put them in a hat. We'd give that hat a really, really good shaking. And then as we give that hat a really, really good shaking, we would then draw out 50 names. 
Okay, there we go. Everybody had an equal chance of being picked, and we had our 50 names. It was purely random, and we have our results. Great. You can appreciate that that actually is going to take a bit of time, right? To write down 500 names, to put them in this massive hat, to shake it up. So, okay, typically we rely on a computer to do this for us. So the problem is, is if we just said to a computer, here's 500 numbers, 500 names, we put a number behind each name, 1 to 500, and say, hey, randomly generate 50 numbers. Those 50 numbers attached to 50 names are going to be the people we pick. Problem is with the random number generator. The problem is in how these numbers are randomly generated. And that is ideally, well, ideally there's two different ways. Well, there's actually lots of different ways, but the problem is is that sometimes our random number generator is gonna pick numbers randomly based off of a normal distribution. So in this case here, there's my mu, my average mean, and my standard deviation. This is problematic, right? This is not how we would want our numbers to be generated. And the reason being is that most of our values, right, the highest probability values are going to be plus or minus one standard deviation. And that is most of these people are going to be right in the middle. This is your highest probability of being uh, picked. So if we had our list organized alphabetically, well, we're going to have people kind of in the middle of the alphabet that have the highest probability of being chosen. If this list was maybe organized by tenure, so one being the person who's been with the company the longest, 500 being the newest employee, well, we're gonna be most likely picking employees in the middle. We're not hearing these guys, we're not hearing these guys. So again, problematic. So what we need to do is that if we are randomly generating numbers with a computer, we need to ensure that it's randomly generating in such a way that every member of the population is equally as likely to be chosen. That is, uniform distribution, 1 to 500, every single value has an equivalent chance of being chosen and an equal probability. So in this case here, if ever you get to that point where you have to run a random generation of numbers to pick something based off this simple random sampling, Make sure that you're doing this for a uniform distribution. Sometimes you have to look into what exactly is happening behind the scenes. Otherwise, you can get biased results, right? You're not truthfully getting a random sample. You're just getting this middle group, most likely. So important to know how your computer is randomly generating. And that's not sorry your computer. That's how the software package you're using is randomly generating numbers. So important, important aside to consider. Okay, that's about all we need to say about simple random sampling. It's fairly simple. The idea behind it, again, all the names of the population in a hat, you pick out how many you want based off of your sample. Okay, let's take a look at our next one then. Our next one is going to be a... Ah, let's change our colors as we work through. Our next one is going to be a systematic random sample. And in this case here, for our systematic random sample, let's presume that you are working, uh, you're working in an audit department, right? So you're an auditor, and in this case here, you're an auditor for some financial institution, some bank, and you need to go and you need to go and check the loan files which the loan officers have originated and make sure that they are free of major errors. So that is. Hey, if the person said they made 100 grand a year, was this verified and was it verified appropriately? Did we get signatures everywhere that we were supposed to get signatures? Were credit checks pulled? All of these kind of facets of that loan documentation, were they satisfied? So, okay, great. You're an auditor. This is your job. You go into the branch and in the branch, there is the giant filing cabinet full of all of these loan files. Right, so okay, here we go. We can draw a little filing cabinet here. Right, there's the one drawer. Here's another drawer here. Put a little handle on them. There we go. And let's say that in this one filing cabinet, there's something like 5,000 files. And so you need to check within these 5,000 files, you need to pull out, oh, let's kind of keep uh, pulling out 50. So you're going to pull out a sample of 50 files in order to determine, okay, 
are there any errors? What's going on? Any major errors going on? So, okay, clearly we could use our simple random sampling in this case as well. We could just, right, we already have file number 1 to 5,000. We could just randomly generate 50 numbers and then pick out those corresponding files. That'd be a little bit time consuming though, right? You'd have to be like, okay, file number 35, count, file number 42, okay, file number 3086, okay, where's that one? Right, so systematic random sampling, you're still going to do a bit of counting, you're still going to be working through it a bit, but it will make it a little bit easier on us. And what we're going to do in systematic random sampling is say, okay, we have 5,000 in our population, we want 50. So if we go n over n, so population over sample, so what's that? 5,000 over 50, zeros cancel out, that's going to be 100. If we go through this and we pull out every hundredth file, so right, we count three, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Pull out that file, carry on, 200, pull out that file, 500, right on and on and on, and we pull out every hundredth file. Well, again, we have randomly sampled from this population. Now, we kind of have a caveat here, right? We have a big assumption that needs to be satisfied. Our assumption in this case, our assumption is that our random variable of interest, so in this case the errors, the major errors in the file, we must assume that this random variable is randomly distributed through the population. So we must assume that our random variable is randomly distributed through the population. Now, okay, what does that mean? You're like, well, Keith, isn't it a random variable? Well, yes, yes it is. But what do we mean by in this case here? We're looking for errors in loan files in this case. So let's suppose that this filing cabinet was actually organized by loans officer. So that is, as we went through this, all of Bob's files are right here. All of Jill's files are over here. And then maybe Barb's files down over there. And I don't know, maybe we have Sally too. And Sally originates a lot of loans. That's all of hers. In this case, we have a problem, right? Systematic random sampling would not be ideal in this case because our errors may not be randomly distributed. That is, maybe Bob, maybe Bob is not very good at his job. Maybe Bob makes lots of mistakes, and that is we would expect lots of errors to be in this spot. However, Barb, Sally, I forget who else I said, they are all really good at their jobs, and they all have very, very few errors. If we did systemic random sampling, pulling out every hundredth, we would miss all of these errors that come in right here in Bob's work. So that's problematic we would not want to use systematic random sampling in this case because we could not assume that errors are randomly distributed. What if instead, what if instead these files were organized by the client's last name, right? So everybody with a last name of A, B, C, and then X, W, Z near the end. Well, okay, I'd have a hard time coming up with a reason as to why I'd be more likely to make a mistake for a client with the last name of B than a last name of Q. So in that case there, likely the chance of there being an error is randomly distributed throughout this filing cabinet. So in this case here, yes, I could use systematic random sampling. So big assumption for this guy, we need our errors to be randomly distributed. They have to be equally as likely to be anywhere in this filing cabinet. So that's our systematic random sampling. So for stratified, random sampling, what we're interested in here is that there is some distribution within the population and we want to uphold this distribution within our sampling. So what exactly do we mean by that? Let's, let's take a look at an example that's really the best way to explain this guy. And let's suppose that we're looking at, here we go, our core capital regional district. So South Island here 
In case you didn't know, in South Vancouver Island, we have 13 different municipalities. Out of these 13 municipalities, I picked the core five, and we're showing their population estimate, along with their corresponding relative frequency. So what we witnessed taking a look at this is that, hey, if we were just to engage in our simple random sampling, that is, if we were just to say, hey, we're going to pick you at random, well, we would have a about 80% chance, just a little bit over an 80% chance that anyone we picked at random was from either Sanit or Victoria. Meaning that as we went through our simple random sampling, we may actually get an entire sample that's only made up of Sanit and Victoria residents, that we would um, miss everybody from View Royal, Oak Bay, and Esquimalt. And suppose we were asking a question about amalgamation, that is, do we take all of these 13 municipalities and amalgamate them together to one? That's a big deal, right? We're now overlooking or ignoring the voices of people who live in Oak Bay, Esquimalt, and View Royal. Right? We're saying, yeah, okay, you have an opinion, but sorry, uh, we randomly sampled, you didn't get a say. Okay, clearly we might want to uphold that. So the way that we would do this, and let's just focus in on a few of these here. So we would have Oak Bay. Oak Bay, we said, was what? 7.5%. We have Saanich. And Saanich here is at 46.83%. And we have Victoria. Victoria at 34.53%. Okay. And then, of course, right, we, we had our other ones, but we'll focus on these three here. What we would want to do is that if, if we wanted to kind of create a survey altogether to ask about amalgamation, we have altogether 242,000 people. Let's say we want to survey 20,000 of them. That's our sample size. That guy there, that's our population. So if we wanted to survey 20,000 of these guys, how do we ensure that our sample is reflective of the population? Well, we're going to send samples out based off of the relative frequency of each one. So what we would do, we would do 20,000 times 0.075. And so what would we do? We'd send 1,500 surveys to Oak Bay. We would take 20,000 and we'd send 46.83% to Senate. So 20,000 times 0.4683. Well, we'd be sending out 93, uh, sorry, yeah, 9366, 9,366 surveys to Saanich residents. And then very similarly, okay, same idea. We want to send 34.53%. So we would send 6,906 surveys to Victoria residents. And we'd carry on doing that, right? We'd also do that for Esquimalt. We would also do that for View Royal. And in that case there, we now have a sample of 20,000, but this sample is now representative. It matches the distribution of the greater population. In this way here, we get equal representation from each region based off of their relative size. Again, the big reason for this is that if we were just to engage in simple or stratified random sampling, sorry, simple or systemic random sampling, we could very easily only end up sampling residents of Saanich, residents of Victoria, and completely ignore View Royal residents, Oak Bay, Esquimalt, right? So possibility of that happening, this stratified random sampling really helps to prevent that. Final one to look at then, our final one is what we would recall or what we would call cluster random sampling. And cluster random sampling, we would use this when we want to sample over a large geographic area. So for example, in political polling and the like. So what we would do is we would take a look at a geographic area that we have interest in. And maybe we are looking at, I don't know, all of Saanich. And we're interested in how Saanich is going to vote in the next federal election, right? What's people's polling tendencies? What parties are they supporting right now? given the situation. And what you would do is, well, Saanich is a pretty big area, right? As we just saw, we have 113,000 people there. Well, what we could do is we could break Saanich up into smaller clusters. 
right? And these clusters, maybe these are geographical boundaries, maybe these are political boundaries, like the different ridings, um, different school districts, maybe they're different neighborhoods, right? You'd have Gordon Head in one area, you would have over by Perks, that Tillicum neighborhood in another area, you would have a little bit more like North Saanich, Cordova Bay over in another one. So you break them up into kind of these neighborhood clusters. Maybe you separate them by postal codes, right? First three digits of your postal code is an identifier of to a region. So all of this, different ways that we could create clusters. And let's say that all together, if you broke Saanich up, we had all together 50 clusters that were chosen. What we would then do is we'd say, okay, we're not going to go to all of these areas. We're just going to pick a few of them in order to be representative of the population. And we're going to pick a few of these at random so that, hey, we get just this. We're not being biased or anything like that, not picking just an easy one. And so we randomly, right, maybe this is just simple random sampling. We maybe pick out five from the 50. So we pick out five of these clusters to look at. And then we say, OK, within these five clusters, we're going to go and engage in some kind of random sampling to determine how many households we're going to contact. So the way that this works, this cluster random sampling, it's able to take a big geographic area and kind of break it down saying, okay, yes, we have the whole of Saanich. Let's break it down into more reasonable chunks. And then within each of these chunks, we're going to then randomly sample which households we're actually going to contact. And the presumption is, each of these clusters is independent. They're all roughly the same representation of the population. And by randomly choosing them all, we'll get a very diverse view and they'll balance each other out. So our cluster random sampling, final four. As we move forward in the course, we're really going to be just assuming a basic, simple random sampling just because it's simple. What we're really doing here is we're kind of making us aware of different forms of sampling that's available to us. But as we carry on here, we'll be taking a look at simple random sampling. So let's go on. Let's carry on with that. Let's take a look at sampling in general and the um, how from sampling arises sampling error. So with sampling error, what we have is the fact that every sample we pull from the population is unique. And every sample we pull out is going to have a different mean, going to have a different standard deviation. They're all from the same population, so they're going to approximate what that population mean is. It's going to give us a good insight as to what the population mean is. But they're all going to have an error. They're all going to be, have this element of falseness to them. To give this some context, let's say we had all together in our class, let's say we had 50 students. And let's suppose of these 50 students, I wanted to uh, determine what the average height was. So, okay, given that we have a population of 50, well, it wouldn't be unrealistic to actually survey the entire population. But let's suppose that we had to instead pull out a sample of 10. Well, every time I sample 10 students, I'm going to get a different average height, right? First time I pull out a sample, I'll get some average height. Maybe this is 170 centimeters. Pull out another 10 students. Well, as I pull out another 10 students, I'm going to get another different height. Maybe this time here, it's 172 centimeters. Do it again. Get another value, and maybe this guy here, 185 centimeters. Maybe just as I randomly sampled a whole bunch of tall people ended up in this group. I could keep going, right? I could keep going. I could go X bar 4. I can just keep pulling out 10 students at random. And in this case here, I have 173. And then X bar 5, I don't know, maybe this guy here is 164. A whole bunch of short people ended up in this group. So really the big kind of takeaway with this is that there is, there is going to be some unknown true population mean. And that's really what I'm trying to get at, right? I'm trying to figure out, hey, what is this true average height amongst the class? If I couldn't get that true population mean, 
Well, we can see, hey, as I pull out sample, 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 I get different values each time, but we see that they're relatively similar. I can kind of take a look at this and say, okay, typically speaking, I'm getting an average around 170. I'm getting a few high numbers, I'm getting a few low numbers, but I'm kind of in this 170 ballpark. So, okay, I probably have a mean somewhere around 170. Cool, great. What we're gonna look at here is kind of where this all falls and what this works out to. So let's take a look at an, exact, um, an example here. Okay, so in this case here, I have a population of 20 incomes. And I, because right, I, here we go, I had my population of 20 incomes. I know that my population mean is $54,987. That's the average income amongst this population. But let's suppose that I were to pull out three samples. So in this case here, I pulled out three samples of size, one, two, three, four, five. So three samples of five. And what we witness is that in each of these samples, I have a different sample mean. In my first sample, I have an average income of 50,718. So okay, I'm a little bit below. Second sample, 55,329. Well, that's not bad, it's a little high, but pretty close. Third sample, well, this guy's quite a bit far away, 64,169. So I've pulled out three samples. We see that, okay, in this case here, and again, this, I just simply random sampled this. I just said, hey, generate me five incomes, pick five at random from that population. Boom, here we go. What I can work out is I can work out my sampling error then. And what my sampling error is, is it's this deviation. It is the deviation from my mean. So this is my true population mean. This is my sample mean. How far has my sample deviated? How much error is in this? So in each case, I can go x bar minus mu to get my sampling error. And so in this case here, right, first one there, 50,718 minus 54,987. Well, I get negative 4,269. So, right, I underestimated this by 4,000. That was my first sample. If I go through this again, x bar 2 minus my mean. Well, okay, x bar 2 minus my mean. What does that work out to? Well, I was only off this guy by 342. So, not too bad. Pretty small sampling error in this guy. x bar 3. What was my third one? Well, third one's quite a bit off. That works out to be 9,183 over. And we see that, okay, our different samples, none of them were exact, but we see that they're kind of all over the place around this true population mean. It turns out, really neat kind of thing here, and this is a neat one that we'll monopolize on. If I were to, well, let's go like this first. If I were to continue to pull out samples. So here I did it three times. Let's say I were to continually pull out samples of size five from a population of 20 again and again and again, and I were to get, okay, X bar minus mu, X bar minus mu, and I were to record all of these sampling errors, right? So every possible sampling error. If I were to take all of these sampling errors and take the sum of them, well, the sum of all of these sampling errors would be equal to zero. And this actually works out to be a really cool feature because what this means is that, well, if we go right back to earlier on in the semester, one of our big uh, properties when we were talking about our properties of the arithmetic mean, mean, we said that one of them was, hey, the summation of x minus mu was equal to zero, right? So that is any time we went to calculate an average, if we took all of our values of x, worked out what the mean was, right? This is also true if we had the sample mean, x minus x bar. If we worked out, hey, what is the sum of all of our deviations from mean? 
we would get zero. This was the whole reason why we had to have variance and standard deviation as our squared deviations from mean. Well, hey, what we're having in this case here then is that every value of x bar from mu, the deviation of my sample mean from my population mean, summation, let's write that down, summation of x bar minus mu equals zero. What we can infer from that then is that if we were to take the mean of means, that is, right, the mean of means, what, what, what's going on there? If we were to go x bar 1 plus x bar 2 plus x bar 3 plus, plus x bar 100, right, all the way up to all of our values of x bar, if we were to go like that and then divide by the number that we pulled out, so okay, in this case here, let's say I pulled out 100, this mean of means would be equal to my true population mean, one and the same. And then even better than this, it turns out that my mean of means will approach this true population mean relatively quickly meaning I don't actually even need to pull out lots and lots and lots of samples. I don't need to pull out every possible sample mean in order to work out what this is. I just need to pull out a large enough number of sample means and I can find my true population mean. Now, this seems rather trivial at first. You're like, okay, why do we care? We just calculated average population average income from our sample. Well, okay, yeah, we could do that there because we have the population information. But in reality, we often don't. But what we can do is we can repeatedly sample. I can repeatedly sample from my population, get a value of x bar, get a value of x bar, get a value of x bar, right? I continually do this, continually do this. And then I can average my averages, right? That's what we did down here. We said, okay, I have 100 averages, so 100 averages divided by 100. And that's going to give me a very, very good estimate of what my true population mean is. In this way, we can say that our sample mean is an unbiased estimator of our population mean. And this is foundational. This gives us such a neat feature that leads into our ability to launch into our central limit theorem. And typically what I do at this point, in a typical case, I would go and I would say, okay, let's go into an experiment. And in this experiment, I would have you roll a bunch of dice and I'd have you calculate the average. And so you'd roll five dice, you would add up the number on those five dice, right? Maybe, let's just take a look at this, right? So maybe you get one, maybe this guy is two, over here is five, and then maybe this guy is six, and over here we have three. So you would add all this up. So that's 6, 12, 17. All right, you get 17 as that guy there. Let's actually write that properly. 17 over 5 dice. So, okay, we have 17 over 5. Wow, I don't know what's going on with my writing right now. 17 over 5. And that would give you an average roll of 3.4. Okay, and then I'd have you do that again. And then I'd have you do that again. And I would have you do that a whole bunch of times. That is, what I'm having you do is I'm having you repeatedly sample from our population. Right? Our population in this case is our number of values from 1 to 6. And there is some true population mean and some true standard deviation of x. That is, if you were to keep rolling dice again and again and again, there is some average value you would obtain with some standard deviation to it. What I'm saying is, okay, yeah, we could work that out quite easily, actually. But let's see what happens if we just repeatedly sample. If we repeatedly sample and we repeatedly pull out these values of x bar. As we do that, and right, if you have the time and you're interested, you can do this quite easily. You can pull out these values of x bar, pull out these values of x bar again and again and again, and then you can take the average of those averages. And if you were to take the average 
of the average, so the summation of all of these sample, all over how many you pulled out altogether, this guy here would approach the true population mean. And in this experiment, we witness this happening. And in this case here, it's like, whoa, it actually is true. It's not just something Keith made up. No, 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 it's not even a contrived experiment. It's just simply rolling dice and you get the true population average just by rolling dice, rolling dice, rolling dice, and then averaging your averages. And this turns out to be massive. This turns out to be massive. And in fact, we can, like I've said a few times, we can end up monopolizing on this because we can then say, okay, okay, if my mean of means is equal to my true population mean, well, then I can say, okay, for, turns out, not only is the mean of means equal to this, but it turns out that my distribution of x bar turns out as a pretty neat feature. It turns out that my distribution of x bar is actually normal. That is, as I calculated all these different values of x bar, let's go back and take a look at that. As I pulled out x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar 3, on and on and on and on, as I pulled out all of these values of x bar from my population, x bar is going to be normally distributed. That is, it's going to look like this. So there's all the possible values of x bar that I could generate. It'll look like a normal distribution. The mean of means, if I were to average all of these, that would be equal to the population mean. And then it's going to have a known standard deviation too. So, okay, I can say that x bar is normally distributed with a mean that is equal to the true population mean of x and a standard deviation. This is the neat part here. Standard deviation is going to be equal to the standard deviation that x was all over the square root of n. That is how big of a sample size I pulled. So, <clears throat> big thing there, n, how big of a sample size I pulled when I calculated x bar, not how many times I pulled out x bar. Right? So, let's go back and just clarify that. In this case here, I had a sample size of 5 but I sampled x bar three times. And this whole bit here where, hey, I said standard deviation of x bar was standard deviation of x all over root n, that's that guy, right? That would be five. That would be my sample size, how large each of those samples were. So big thing to get straight because yes, we're repeatedly sampling, but we're repeatedly sampling of the same sample size. So this is really cool. This now means that if my mean is normally distributed, I can now convert this to a standard normal, and I can now work out the probability of obtaining some mean that I've obtained. And to add to this, we get a really cool feature. This is true almost irrespective of how x is distributed. And I say almost irrespective because we have three kind of criteria, and let's take a look at this. So we have, let's take a look at the distribution of x to start. There we go. So three different distributions of x. And let's start off by saying that x itself is normally distributed. Next, we're going to presume that x is symmetrically distributed. So I'm going to use a uniform here, but it doesn't have to be uniform. It just has to be a symmetric distribution. So first case, x is normal, x is symmetric, and in the third case, x is unknown. And this includes a really ugly or really skewed distribution. So let's just, instead of just leaving it blank, let's just give it a really ugly, unknown, skewed distribution. Let's say it's like doing something like this. There we go. We have something like that for x, right? So very clean, nice, clean, nice. Oh, what's going on here? For each of these, we have the corresponding distribution of x bar. That is, if we were to pull a sample mean out of here and continually pull a sample mean out of here, what would be that distribution of the sample means? And if we were to do that, well, we know 
that the mean of sample means is one and the same as the true population mean. So okay, we can center this. We can center this, and let's just do this for each one. So right about there, that'd be about the mean of my uniform. Maybe I have that a bit to the right, but we get the idea. And this guy here, I don't know about where the mean is. We got some pretty extreme values out there that's probably pulling the mean to the left. I'm going to say maybe something like that is where my mean is. So mean of x, mean of x. Okay. In each of these cases, x bar will be normally distributed, centered around the true population mean. In the case where x is normal, we'll say that, okay, x bar will be normally distributed if we get a sample size of greater than or equal to 3. So that is almost any sample size we pull out. As long as we have more than 3 being pulled out, our sample mean will be normally distributed. And then purposefully, right, you'll notice that this guy actually is t more tightly packed to the mean than our actual population was. And again, keep in mind, that was because this guy has a standard deviation of x. My sample mean has a standard deviation of x bar, which is the standard deviation of x all over the square root of n. As n is a positive whole number bigger than 1, my standard deviation of sample means is always going to be smaller than the standard deviation of the true population. It's always going to be more tightly packed true to the true mean. Pretty cool. Okay, what about if it's symmetric? So not a normal distribution, but a symmetric distribution. Well, if that's the case there, again, I'll be normally distributed. That should be a normal. If I have a sample size of greater than or equal to 10. So in this case here, I need a few more observations in order for normality to hold. But as long as I'm pulling out sample sizes of 10 or more, my value of my mean will be normally distributed. So again, great feature here as long as I have a large enough sample size. Finally, what about this guy here? This completely unknown, ugly distribution. Well, again, if it's this completely unknown, ugly distribution, I will still be normally distributed. Yes, even in this case here, the sample mean will be normally distributed around the population mean if and only if I pull out a sample size that's greater than or equal to 30. So in this case here, I need to have a bit of a larger sample size, but the larger sample size I pull out, the more accurate results I get. And in this case here, kind of our good rule, as long as we're pulling out sample sizes of 30, well, we can always assume normality for the distribution of sample means. If ever we have a sample size falling below 30, well, then we need to say, okay, can we assume our population is symmetric? If it's symmetric, great, we only needed a sample size of 10. If we fall below a sample size of 10, we have to say, can we assume our population is normally distributed as well? If that's true, well then great, we only need a sample size of three. If it's not true, right, if at any point we're like, oh, I cannot assume that I have a normal population, but I have a sample size only of n equals five, ah, if we have n equals five, but we can't assume normality, we have a problem. We cannot move forward. Same kind of idea. If I have a sample size of 15, but I can't assume that I have a symmetric distribution for my population, I can't move forward, right? If I can't make this assumption, I need the next bigger sample size. If I can't assume normality, I need at least 10. If I can't assume symmetry, I need at least 30. So kind of our walk through our check as we go through things. Okay, this video, really what we're getting at is just the idea. We took a look at why we sample, the necessary fact of sampling. We then took a look at how we sample. And then we took a look at how that worked out into sampling error, how every sample we pull has some deviation from that true mean. And the neat fact that, hey, all of these deviations from mean sum to zero, which means that 
our mean of means is the true population mean. We then introduce this idea that, hey, because, because every time we pull out a sample, we get a new value of x bar. Well, hey, even though this is a sample statistic, this is also a random variable. And because it's a random variable, because every time we pull out a sample, we get a random value, a new value of x bar, because this is the case, it's going to be normally distributed if these conditions are met. And it will be normally distributed given this. Centered around that true population mean of x with a standard deviation equal to the standard deviation of x all over root n. So neat little feature. What we're going to be looking at in the next video is how exactly we monopolize on this, how we utilize it, and some follow through situations as well. So next video is just going to be a whole bunch of essentially application. How do we utilize the central limit theorem and a few examples on the utilization of it. If you have any questions with the basics though of the idea of sampling or there's a bit of introduction to the central limit theorem, please feel free to give me, shoot me a line either through email or post to the frequently asked questions on D2L.